Well, it's me again. I want to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, man, I just appreciate the opportunity Brother Eddie's given me a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity and a lot of learning experiences and a lot of just, uh, it's just been a blessing to me for sure, and I appreciate y'all uh, listening to me today. Today I want to try to, uh, you know, we've been talking about the gospel and we've been talking about, if you've been with us probably the last week, we've been talking about um, <coughs> The gospel, as far as the bad news of the gospel, the good news, and our victory within it. And today, I want to kind of slow down just a minute, and I want to I want to try to teach you something from the word today. And uh, so, it may be it may be a little it may be um, it may be that we may have to kind of listen a little more intently, or maybe just concentrate a little more. Maybe I'll just try to speak a little slower. Maybe try to help you kind of kind of stay with me um, because. It's, it's pretty important, not more important than everything else we preach, but it's pretty important today, especially. So, uh, what I'm going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and what I'm going to do today is, <clears throat> as you're turning there, I want to talk to you about the church, and about <clears throat> the, the part that the church plays in, in your spiritual growth, in your growth toward God, in your deepening of your relationship with God, all those things that, as a Christian, you desire. And I can say that you desire them, and I can say it about all of you if you're a Christian, because the Holy Spirit has put it in your heart to desire Him. He's put it in your heart to desire to walk with Him and to be a, in a deeper relationship with Him, to, <clears throat> to know more of His will and to, to follow His will, to live in uh, more holiness and righteousness than we are currently. So I know it's there <clears throat> if you're a believer. And so I want to I share with you the fact that as far as the church goes, and when I say church, I'm going to use church a lot. I'm going to say the word a bunch of times today. When I say the word church, I'm not talking about the worldwide invisible body of Christ, that, uh, talking about believers all around the world. That is how the Bible uses the word church in a lot of instances, but it also uses it as the local church, the, the fellowship. I'm talking about <clears throat> this local church right here, and then there's a church in Stanton, and then the church in whatever, you know, the Bible uses the church of Rome, the church of Corinth. So I'm talking about the local church. And what I want you to understand <clears throat> is that although you'll hear a lot today about, you know, me and Jesus got our own thing going and just me and my Bible out in front of the oak tree and we got it going on, um, that's not a position that the New Testament writers take. They see the local church as, uh, well, in fact, in 1 Timothy 3.15, you can write that down and you can look at it later, 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul calls the local church the pillar and the foundation of truth, the pillar and the ground of truth. So it is supremely important. All the letters in the New Testament were written to groups of people. Although we read them and we see the word you and we say, oh, he's talking to me. And there is, he is talking to you. But those letters are in the plural you. They're talking to the, the church at Rome. He never intended to address people who weren't associated with the church in whatever city the letter went to. So what I want to show you today is that by not being the church, I put on the sign one time, stop going to church and start being the church. I don't know if you all remember that, but <clears throat> by not being the church, you are shooting yourself in the foot spiritually. All the things that you want, out of your relationship with God. And I'm not talking about greedy, like I want a new car and I want a house. I'm talking about good, what, what you need to be wanting, a deeper relationship with God, uh, a closer walk with Him, uh, just all those things that you want. You're, you're actually impeding that happening by neglecting the local church. And I'm going to prove that from Scripture, and I want to show you that today in First uh, Thessalonians 5. Paul here is talking, and this is the last, cha last chapter of this book, and you know it's the, the last words he's going to say to the Thessalonians in this first book of First Thessalonians. He'll write them another letter later, but this is his last words now. And he's talking about, at the beginning of this chapter, he's talking about the end, you know, talking about when Jesus returns and the dead will be rising, and you don't have to worry about those that have already fallen asleep because um, they're with Christ, and he's going to bring them. And he's talking about all that, and his final words in this chapter are, okay, this is what you need to be doing now. 
Okay, as you're waiting for Christ, as you're waiting for these things to happen, this is what you need to be. And he's not addressing what goes on outside the church. We know that the church is for evangelism and mission and, and to go and reach the lost. He's talking about what's going on in the church. Who do you need to be in the church? Okay, and he gives three things that are your responsibility. I want This may sound strange to you, but I want you to understand that to be part of the church, you have a responsibility. It's not, just, it's not just coming into a building and hearing the preaching of the word and even believing what the word is saying and then going out and going home. You have a responsibility to be the church. And I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, there's people that go out on those uh, uh, door-to-door evangelism things, and they, I talk to them, and they say, well, you know, we, we talked to somebody who's a member of your church, and, you know, they ain't been here in a year. And it's like, no, they're not really a member of my church. You know, they're not really a member here. I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. The New Testament doesn't know anything about the church membership card that you sign. It don't know anything about that, okay? So what I want to show you is there's a difference between, there's a difference between being the church and attending the church. And I want to show you that. And, uh, well, let's just read it. You have three responsibilities. Let's just put it that way. You have a responsibility to the spiritual leadership that God has put here. You have a responsibility to each other as the body of Christ. And you have a responsibility to God. And I want to show you those things. Uh, Verse 12. Man, I'm still in Romans from Sunday school. Let me get to the right place here. Verse 12 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Let's stop right there, just those two verses. Um, This is your duty, your responsibility as a church, as a body, your responsibility to the spiritual leadership, to the spiritual shepherd that God has given you. Now, I'm going to use the word shepherd because the word pastor in the scripture comes from a word that means shepherd, and that pretty much signifies his job as the shepherd. A shepherd feeds and grows and protects the sheep, and that's That's what he's called to do. That's what the pastor is called to do. And I want to show you that the leadership of the the church, this church, that church, any church, I'm not talking about just Christ church, any church, any local body, their leadership is a gift to you from God. It's a gift to you from God. It's not that somebody's going to keep you under their boot heel. It's not that somebody's going to keep you under their thumb and tell you what you're supposed to be doing. It's a gift from God. You see, he gives men gifts, spiritual gifts. Everybody has spiritual gifts. But he gives leaders their spiritual gifts to show you how the word applies to you. So we're all reading the same word, and he can take your, you know, the, the, the Bible isn't going to say, hey, you know what, you need to go next door to your neighbor and tell him you're sorry for taking, you know, taking his lawnmower without telling him. But it'll say, you know, it'll say go to your neighbor and whatever, and, and the, your spiritual leader, your pastor, your shepherd is the one who applies that to your specific circumstance and it's a gift for you to grow and when you when you disregard that when you disregard that gift you impede your own growth now i'm i'm not standing up here i could stand up here and i could give you a million reasons why uh brother eddie deserves for you to do this or to do that and how he's done great and everything but that's not what paul is teaching here he's teaching that the actual office that he holds whether you got a great pastor or whether you got a sorry pastor the office that he holds It deserves acknowledgement. That's the word. It means, it says, when it says you know your leaders, it means to acknowledge them. And it doesn't mean pin a medal on them. It doesn't mean hug them every time you see them. It doesn't mean just, you know, shower them with praise and honor all the time. What it means is is when they they instruct you, admonish you, that's what admonish means, instruct. When they instruct you in the ways of the Lord, that you take that to heart and you take that office as a serious thing and that instruction as a serious thing and you learn from that and you grow from that. That's what it means. It, it, means, it doesn't mean doing all kind of other things and, and making sure you give him gifts and all that kind of stuff. It's the office that Paul is talking about. It's the office of pastor that deserves. In Hebrews thirteen seventeen, it says, I'm going to try to do it from memory, it says, to obey them that have the rule of you in the Lord, for they watch for your soul. I mean, the reason, the reason that you are to take this instruction uh, to heart from your shepherd is because he watches for your soul. And the next part of that verse says, as he will give an account. So not only does he watch for your soul, but he gives an account 
for watching for your soul. So that's, that's, what he is, that's what he is doing. And it says, you know, it's not just because he's a great dude or because he's doing great or because of all these things. It says because of the work. It because, because of the work. Right, right there. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, for their job, for what they're doing, for their, for their office that they hold. That office is, you know, it's a burden. It's a burden for one thing, but it's also a gift from God to you. And when, when you just chunk that under the bus, you're destroying your own spiritual growth. I mean, I, I'm trying to get it where you can understand. You're destroying your own spiritual growth. It's like kids taking medicine. Sophie will not take medicine. She will not. And I was like, you're going to like it. It tastes like bubble gum. And it's going to be good for you. But she will not. It doesn't matter if it tastes bad or tastes good. She just doesn't want it not going to take it. She doesn't realize that that's to help you. It's to help you and it's to grow you. It's, that's what it's there for. That is the job. That is the gift. That is what they're there for. Um, people want to grow. If you're a believer, you want desperately to grow. You have to because God said he would put it in your heart. If you are a believer, you desperately want. Now, some of us have tried for so long we didn't gave up. But you desperately long in your heart to grow. You desperately long to walk closer to God. You desperately long to please Him. You desperately long for those things. And God has given you gifts to help you grow. And we're just throwing them in the trash. You ever heard that joke about the two boats in the helicopter where the guy's like, save me from the flood, and a boat comes, and a boat comes, and a helicopter comes. He says, no, the Lord will take care of me, and he dies. And he said, God, why didn't you save me? He said, man, I sent two boats in a helicopter. We're saying, God, I want to grow. I want to do these things. And he's sending you the leadership to help you. He's sending you the body of Christ to help you. He's sending you the word and people in your path. And we're just chunking them out the window. And we're still saying, God, help me. Please help me. And he sent that to you. I'll give you a perfect example. Um, two years ago, uh, I'm saying two years. I don't know how long it's been. It's been a while, but um, the Lord told us, and I can say it that way, that what we need to do is we need to start the Sunday school. and We need to start growing in closer fellowships with each other. We need to start having teaching, and we need to start, you know, all those things that, I mean, he, Brother Eddie stood behind this pulpit right here, and I remember him saying it. about He, he even said, look, j don't even come to preaching. He said, just come to Sunday school, and that's it. And then you can go home. If you've got to come to one thing, don't come to this. Come to Sunday school. I mean, it was that important that God had put it on his heart. It was that big to him. Y'all know how Brother Eddie likes to preach. It was that big to him that you, he would say, look, don't even come to preaching. Just come to Sunday school if you want to come to one or the other. And, and you know, I, I remember talking to someone and, and they just would not come. Just would not come. And you know me, I'm, I'm kind of a smart aleck. I'm kind of pushy and, you know, I just have my ways. And I, I was just talking to him and I was like, you know, you just really need, it, it would be good for you. You know, if you, when you go to the hospital, you're going to, you know, your Sunday school class is going to come around you and they're going to, they're going to minister to you, and they're going to help you and bring you food, and they're going to know when you're not here, and that's how we keep up with people. And that's how we know who's sick, and that's how we know, you know, that is how we do it, is those small groups, those Sunday school classes. That's how we keep up with what's going on in people's family, and that's how we minister and love on people and how we reach out into the lives of our church. That's how we do it. And so they were like, no, I, I don't need nothing like that. I'm good. I'll just come. I'm just going to come and sit and be and. And, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not nobody's boss. I'm not sheriff. So I just, you know, okay, if that's what you want, it's fine. Well, they're not here today. You know what happened? A couple months after we had that conversation, they went to the hospital. And they come out of the hospital going, I just can't believe nobody in my church came to visit me. That person had a chance to grow. They had a chance. God had sent them us. He had, that God had sent them the Sunday school. God had sent them... A, a fellowship of people around them that would love them and cherish them and, and take care of them and meet spiritual and physical needs in their life, but they just refuse to go, just refuse to go. And what it boils down to is not having, not having respect for the office, not having respect for the office. Now, we'll see at the end of this phase, it's not, it's not just following blindly. You have the word. When, when the spiritual shepherd gets up and, he, and he's talking from the word and the word agrees with what he says, it's just like God is speaking to you. I mean, duh. If you, if you, I mean, if you don't heed it, what do you think is going to happen? It's just like God speaking. So I want to show you that, that these gifts are given. This is The first one is to the shepherd. You have a responsibility 
You have a responsibility before God. It's a command. It says, let me read it again, verse 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, teach you, and to esteem them very highly in love's sake for, in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. You see that little phrase that says, be at peace among yourselves? That is connected to those two verses before. Be at peace among yourselves. See, Paul knows in his other letters, Paul knows that the one thing that's going to destroy a church quicker than anything else is disunity. Disunity out from under the spiritual shepherd that God has given them. In James chapter 4, um, James says, Do you know why you, there's wars among you? Do you know why you fight amongst each other? It's because you desire and you don't have and you go to war to get what you, what you want. And then that's where it says, you have not because you ask not. And in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1, the whole problem with the Corinthian church that had all these, all these issues going on with it that Paul had to address, the whole problem was they were not unified under the shepherd that God had given them. One said, hey, I'm of Apollos. And one said, hey, I'm of Paul. And one said, I'm of Peter. And that caused the division that ended up causing the whole problem in the, in the uh, Corinthian church. So... This be at peace among yourselves, this is a direct result of following your, the, the office of the shepherd that God has given you. It's following the office. I'm not talking about the man. I'm talking about the office. That office is a gift from God to you to help you grow, to help you, to help you learn. And, and we chunking it under the bus. We chunking it under the bus com continually. It destroys the church. In fact, Paul was so, look what he said at the beginning of 12. We beseech you. He's saying, please, 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 we urge you. Look, please don't do this. Please do this. See, in verse 14, he switches gears. When he talks about the body, he says, now we exhort you. But before that, he said, look, the worst thing you can do is not to be unified. The worst thing a church can be is, is splintered. Um, it's just, he said, please. We beseech you, whatever you do, don't do this. Whatever you do, don't do this. That office is given for your benefit. It's given for you. It's given for your growth, for your maturity. And the local church is here for the same thing. You also have a responsibility to the body, to each other. Okay? You have a responsibility to you, and you have a responsibility to you, and you have, you have a responsibility to each other. Look at verse 14. It says, Now we exhort you, brethren... Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. I'm going to go through these quickly because those are pretty self-explanatory. I mean, you don't need me to go in depth on any of those. You can understand them. What I do want to say is that unruly has the idea of kind of a soldier stepping out from under, under his army. Um, and to warn those, you notice whose job it is. Whose job is it to warn the unruly? It's not the spiritual shepherd's job to warn the unruly. What does Paul say? He's talking to the congregation. Brethren, we exhort you to warn the unruly. And it's not just a critical threatening, hey, you guys better start getting in line, I'm going to smack you in your face. You know, It's not like that. It's not critical and it's not threatening. In fact, it doesn't even have to be verbal. You know, the, the local church, the body, the fellowship, the assembly of believers should be such a tightly knit group. And I'm talking about this local church and that local church and that local church. They should be, in their own fellowship, they should be such a tightly knit group of people that it is impossible, just by definition, you couldn't be a member of that group unless you're walking with the group. I mean, think about a bunch of people walking down the road. You can't say, I'm in the group if I'm walking over here by myself. I mean, just by definition, it don't make sense. So the church should be such a unified, tightly knit group of people following the word, following, like Paul said, follow me as I follow after Christ, following our shepherd as, we fo as he follows after Christ to such an extent that it would just seem dumb. I mean, it would just seem dumb for somebody to say, I go to Christ church, but I don't go to Christ church. I mean, it's just kind of dumb. I mean, it just doesn't even make sense. It's not that you don't warn the believer to get them or whatever when they're unruly. You warn them to bring them into fellowship, to bring them, to restore them. Um, you can't really, the Bible says, I'm going to tell you something. The church, the body, you guys, this local church, 
is given for your benefit. It's given for your growing, for your strengthening. The believer is under constant attack by, you know, spiritual forces. We know that. You know that. Um, the Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion going to and fro seeking. Have you ever watched the Discovery Channel? Which gazelle does the lion go after? The one that's off by itself. That's exactly what happens. The, God has given you each other for that purpose, that you strengthen one another and that you comfort one another and that you be patient with one another. Feeble-minded doesn't mean like mentally challenged. It means like the word is little-souled. It means... It means like faint-hearted or weak or something like that. So God has given you each other, and you have a responsibility to each other. You can't just say, I'm a member of the church and not be the church. You have a responsibility to be the church. You have a responsibility to share each other's vision, to, to go in the same direction, to sweat with each other and to cry with each other and to rejoice with each other and to... to to enjoy other successes. When somebody has a baby, you rejoice with them. When somebody dies in their family, you cry with them. You have a responsibility to do that. But you know what? It's an investment, and it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's a whole lot easier to come on in them doors 15 minutes after we've started, sit down and leave 10 minutes early, and never have to deal with anybody. Never have to go, and I don't have to deal with all them people that's hurting I don't have to invest myself in those people that need comfort. I don't, have to, I don't have to stretch myself out there and let somebody try to minister to me. I don't have to do... That's hard. It's so much easier just to not have to worry about that kind of stuff. It's, not, it's just so much easier. Look at the rest of these. Let's just go quickly through them. I'm not going to just nail on each, each one of them. Um, we have comfort. We have support. We have patience. We have see that none render evil for evil. Notice it doesn't just say, hey, you don't render evil for evil. It says, see that none other render evil for evil. Follow that which is after good, both among yourselves and as the church out in the world. You follow after that which is good. Um, that's just not, it's just hard to do that, isn't it? It's just hard to do that, and nobody wants to do that. And our, our common refrain is, I just don't know them very well. You know? I would go to the baby shower, but I just don't know them very well. I would go to their wedding, but I just don't know them very well. You know, one of the things as I was studying and praying and, and, and kind of bringing this, you know, trying to, trying to see what God would have me do, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm pretty inadequate in all this, but as I was, as I was putting this together or, or thinking and praying about what God wanted me to say, Billy kept coming up, you kept coming up in my mind, Billy, and, how, you know, he comes on Saturday. Y'all probably don't know this, but he comes on Saturday, every Saturday, and sets all them tables and chairs up, and him and Miss Pat and them, they all come and cook in the morning, and, 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 and we swoop in there like locusts at 920 and eat up all the sausage biscuits and enjoy it, and, and I do too, and it's good. And then when Billy gets married, 12 people show up. But that's not our job to comfort, and it's not our job to support, and it's not our job to be patient, you know. We tell Brother Eddie, Brother Eddie, my, my third cousins, college roommates, friends, brothers, uncles in the hospital, you think you go visit them? I think it ought to be a rule that w nobody's allowed to ask the pastor to visit somebody until you visit them first. Oh, then after you visit them, the pastor will go visit them. <laughs> now, you need to understand, that's my rule. That's not his rule. He's going to go regardless. It don't matter what I say. So... <clears throat> I remember working at Maytag. Y'all remember when Maytag was in Jackson? I didn't work there very long. <laughs> but uh, in May, what, May, what makes Maytag different than other factories is that you, they don't have middle management. You have, I mean, you got to work on the line and you have to do like housekeeping committee or maintenance committee or, what, uh, you know, all this other, all that stuff. You got to do that stuff. And I remember telling my boss, I was like, look, man, I want to come. I'll be here on time every day, and I want to come, and I'm going to sit on my part of the line, and I'm going to put my part on the dishwasher, and I'm going to go home. And I don't, want, I don't want nothing to do with your committee. I don't want nothing to do with your housekeeping or your maintenance or all that. You just leave me alone, and you let me put my part on the dishwasher, and I'm going to go to heck home. And I ain't worried about all that. Well, I didn't last long at ATEC. <laughs> but that's what, 
that's the same thing. Look, that's the same thing we do at church. I'm going to come in them doors. I'm going to sit in that seat. And you better preach real good. And you better play real good. And the music better not be too loud. And I'm not going to invest myself in helping anybody. I'm not going to invest myself in listening to somebody else cry on my shoulder. I'm not going to invest myself in rejoicing when somebody gets married. or to, I'm not going to put myself in anybody else's life, and I don't want none of y'all in my life. That's the, way we do, that's the way we do church. And then we got the mistaken impression that just signing a role somewhere makes us a member of the fellowship here at Christ Church. I want to say this for the radio and for the for the camera. Y'all ain't members if you ain't coming. <clears throat> there is 58, at least 58, at least 58 times in the New Testament, God gives us a one another command to pray for one another, lift up one another, comfort one another. 58 times, 58 times. That is the life of of the church all the time you are to be doing there's a one another do this to one another help one another do this to one do you really think we take that those commands and we say you know what it means is if I'm in my house and I'm watching Dukes of Hazard and somebody knocks on the door and I open the door and that's a believer right there oh I'm supposed to do good to them do you think he meant just whenever you get an opportunity do you do no he's assuming there are assu the New Testament writers assume that you are a member of a local church, that you are together in fellowship with a group of believe, believers. It doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be a church of a thousand. It doesn't have to be a church of a hundred. But you are in a fellowship and you are ministering together and y'all are living the life of Christ as a community. That's what, that's what the New Testament writers, um, that's what they assume. So what I'm saying to you today, and I'm almost through, is that there is no membership in the local church without ministry in the local church. Okay? There is no minute. There is, you are not a member if you are not involved in the ministry. Brother Eddie can chastise me later, but I'm saying it right now. You are not a member if you are not in the ministry. In some way, shape, or form. Now, it may just be something as simple as opening the door or praying for people or something, but you are involved in the ministry some kind of way. There is no membership without fellowship. I'm sorry. There is no membership without fellowship. I am not, I, hey, I am with you. I am not a people person. Y'all know that? I'm not a people person. I have struggled with all that. I work at it hard. I'm not a people person. But you have to be involved in fellowship with the brethren. You know, Jesus even said that it was one of the evidences of salvation. This is how the world will know that you are my disciple because you love the brethren. That's an evidence of salvation. How can you love the brethren if you don't assemble where the brethren assemble? And you don't have to do it here wherever your local church is. I mean, it, it didn't say just at Christ Church. There's churches all over. You just have to get in one, and you have to be a member of it. You have to be in fellowship with it. You have to be in the ministry of it. You have to be living the life of Christ in that community. That's what it's for. Just coming in here and listening to preaching and music and going home does not make you a member of the church, does not make you a member of the bride of Christ, and it does not make you in fellowship with us. When you, when you come and you want to be involved in the ministry, but you refuse to put yourself under the leadership of the spiritual shepherd God has given us, guess what? You ain't part of this ministry. You ain't in this fellowship. You aren't a member of this church. I don't care what you wrote your name on. Okay? So we all have spiritual gifts that God has given. I already said that once. Um, we all do. It, every believer does. You have a spiritual gift. But what, what often, you know, we talk about, let's discover our gift. And those are good programs, and I've done them before, to discover your spiritual gift and what, what it is that you're supposed to be doing. But one thing that we often forget is that everywhere it talks about those spiritual gifts, both in Corinthians and in Romans 12, is that those gifts were meant to be used in the body of Christ. They were meant to be used in the body of Christ, whether it's mercy or helps or, or any, anything like that. They were meant to be used in the body of Christ. You remember the, the servant with a talent? You know, a talent's just a measurement, so it could have been anything, a skill, resource, whatever. Uh, his was money. Do you, you remember that, the, the, the servant that buried his talent? You know what the, remember what the master said to him? You wicked, lazy servant. God gave him something, and he just refused to use it in the body of Christ for God's glory. Now, what Paul's talking about here is what the church should be 
in the church. Now, we know there's lots of other places where we're talking about going out in evangelism, saving the lost, and bringing them in. But what he's talking about here is what we are to each other, what we are in the church. The last thing that you have a responsibility for as a part of the church is to God. You have a responsibility to the spiritual leadership that God has put here, the office of shepherd that God has put here. Hey, whether you like it or not, I know some of you, I mean, you may be thinking, bring your Bible. I mean, we can go verse by verse, and I will show you that the office office of pastor is a biblical office that God put for your growth and for your benefit, and it is to be, it is to be respected, whether you like it or not, whether your pastor is a good one or not, whether you, live, whether you live down the road or whether you live in Michigan. It don't matter. It don't matter. The office, God is in control of all things, and he put somebody there for your benefit. He put somebody there for your benefit. To God. Look what it says, verse 16. I'm going to run real fast through these because these are really self-explanatory. It says, rejoice evermore. What you need to know about these commands is they're all plural. They're all plural. Now, you can sit out in the oak tree with your Bible and say, he's telling me to rejoice, and you'd be right. He is telling you to re be rejoiced. But right here, he's telling the church to rejoice. He's telling, literally, it says, it says, at all times, you all be rejoicing. And what that's talking about is our church, our fellowship, our specific local church. When you pray, you, you rejoice. When you minister, you rejoice. When you meet together, you rejoice. We have the gospel. We have the only thing you can rejoice in. When y'all go out into your lives in the, in the world and, and the workforce just beats you down and everything just seems junky, you come back in here and we rejoice together. And we remind each other that we're child of the, children of the king and that we, we live in this gospel and we have victory. We rejoice together evermore. It says pray without ceasing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you walk around with your eyes shut all the time praying. It's talking about the community. It's a plural command. It's talking about the community. When we do anything as a church, we pray without ceasing. When we minister, when we preach, when we worship, when we, when we counsel, when we do all these things, we pray without ceasing. And that lets God direct everything that goes on in our church. When we, when we go to minister or go out on a, a program or when we do anything, we pray without ceasing. And God gets involved in what we're doing. Um, I don't, if any of y'all have ever counseled anybody, I know you know the importance of prayer. Because, I mean, if you want to talk about big, huge theological, the hypostatic union and all that, I'm your man. But when you talk about what should I do about my wife, I'm like, whew, man, that's a tough one, you know, because that's a life decision. What I tell you, you're going to take that and change your life with, that's a responsibility. So when I see folks coming and I know they're going to ask me something, I'm like, oh, God, please tell me what to do. Tell me what to say. I don't know what to tell them. What am I supposed to do here? Pray without ceasing in all your ministry and all your things that you do whether you worship, you fellowship, and it's God-directed. Be thankful. I'm just kind of hurrying up. Be thankful for this is the will of God in Christ. What's the will of God for our church? To be thankful. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Quench not the Spirit. All these things, as we end up right here, all these things that we've talked about, um, you can quench the Spirit when you don't rejoice, when you don't pray, when you don't, when you don't, um, remain under the leadership that God has provided. When you don't, uh, you know, when you don't love one another, when you don't comfort one another, when you don't minister to one another, when you when you hide uh, from the fellowship because you don't want to be involved with somebody, or you don't want nobody involved with you, um, you quench the spirit. And that doesn't sound like such a bad thing, really. I mean, what does it really mean to quench the spirit? Until you realize what is. Do you know what the spirit's doing in the church? I mean, there's quite a few things that he's doing. He's, he's bringing the lost to salvation. He's convicting the world. It says he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's bringing the lost. He's growing you in your spiritual walk. That's what the Spirit does. He's growing you in your victory. He's, uh, he's glorifying Christ. He's doing all those jobs. And when, when we fail to be the church and we start just coming to church, we smother his work. And people stop coming under conviction to be saved. Christians stop growing in their walk. They stop growing together in fellowship, start growing apart. They stop saying, they stop thinking, you know, all these things happen. So it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a small thing to quench the spirit because the spirit is basically, is basically involved in our mission as a church, involved in reaching the lost. 
involved in exhorting the brethren, involved in, in doing all those things. And when we smother his work, you can see it. You can see it. People aren't coming to be saved anymore. People are growing apart. Um, people are not finding it necessary to come, not just to come to service, but just to come and be involved with you guys, to come to, to be involved with the ministry or come to be involved in the events that we do or the things that we do to reach out into the community. It's just not important anymore. It's because we're quenching the spirit with the way that we're doing church and we're not being the church. The last thing I'm going to show, show you is where it says, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That's the word. You want, respond to the word of God. Don't get fooled into thinking prophesying is, is just fortune telling or telling the future. It's preaching. It's preaching the word of God. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament over and over and over again, 99.9% .9 of the time when a prophet came and spoke, he was not telling the future. He was saying, hey, guys, this is what the Lord says. And the Lord says this. And over and over again in the Old Testament you read, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah or Isaiah or whatever, saying this. And this is what he said. So when, when the preacher gets up and he, he takes the word of God, which is God's words, and he says, this is what God says, that's, that's prophesying. It says, despise not prophesying, prove all that which is good. He doesn't leave us in the dark to say, is, is, is he right about what he's saying? No, you've got the word. You prove all things. I mean, you prove all things and you hold fast to that which is good. So today you have a choice because I've stood before you and I've read from the scripture. Now, you've got a choice. You've got, I guess, probably three different choices. Number one, I'm just a big old dumb kid that don't know nothing about nothing and I've completely misinterpreted what scripture has said. That's one option. Number two, I am deliberately deceiving you to get... I don't know, a bunch of people to come to church maybe or something, whatever. I'm deliberately deceiving you for some reason to get something. That's possible. Or number three, I'm correctly interpreting what Paul has said. Therefore, it is a command from God for us. Okay? So if the first two, if one of the first two is what you believe is true, then you have no responsibility to do nothing. You can walk out of here just the same way you came in and don't worry about it. Rock on. It'll all be fine. If the third one is true, then now you have a responsibility before God to obey what he said in his word, which means that you have a responsibility to the spiritual leadership of this local fellowship if you remain here. If you don't like it, you got to go find you somebody that you can get behind. You have a responsibility to the spiritual leadership. You have a responsibility to each other in the body, and you have a responsibility to God to worship and obey him in this fellowship. You have a responsibility. Now, I want to say one last thing before Brother Eddie comes is that this is a grace given to you. The church is a grace given to you for your growth. If you lack, God wants to grow you. He wants to grow you to be Christ-like. And if you lack compassion, he's going to send you somebody that you're going to need to have compassion on. And if, if you lack patience, he's going to send you somebody. You know what? We know that we're all sinners and that we're all saved by grace and that we're all here by the grace of God. So sooner or later, somebody is going to step on your foot. It's going to happen. And God's going to develop patience in you for that. He's going to develop compassion in you. And that's how you grow in Christ. It's through the interaction of the body of Christ. It's through the word of God as it's preached. As you study, it's through the Spirit of God as He moves among you in the community. That's how you grow. Don't shoot yourself in the foot thinking that you don't have to be involved in the church and you can still grow in your relationship with Christ. If somebody walk, can you imagine me walking, somebody walking up to me and saying, Jason, you are the man. You are the greatest thing since sliced bread, but your wife is stupid and I don't like her and I'm not going to be around you. Do you think I would say, hey, guess what? Yeah, we can hang out. No. Heck no. But that's what we do to Christ. We're like, Jesus, I love you. It's great. But it's a bunch of hypocrites in your bride. And I'm not going to mess around with him. Are you, can you imagine such a thing? What would be more offensive than that? I love you, Jesus, but I hate your bride. No. No. Today, whether you lost, if you're lost, you need to be saved. Amen. Brother Eddie's going to come and he's going to give you an invitation. But today it's time for us believers, whoever we are in here, 
it's time for us to join the church. Quit coming, quit coming, quit attending and start being the church. You have a responsibility to the leadership, to each other, and to God in being the church. friend Jerry Glover he's he's come to our church I don't know it's been a little while a couple months huh yeah got to coming you know just uh got to doing good and um decided we want to get saved and he did and uh this week's been a tough week on him he, he's told me he wants to confess that 